We, as a people, are impatient. And we live in an impatient world. We want things faster. We want them easier. We want them for our own betterment. We are impatient when these things do not happen. We're the kind of people as we're watching our five-minute meal being cooked in the microwave, count down the seconds and wonder why it's not coming even faster. We are the kind of people who check out the wait time at the urgent care center because we don't really care how bad our leg is broken. We want to know how long we're going to have to wait to get some help. We are people who are just like this turtle on the skateboard. We may not like our circumstances. We may not like the way life is going. We may not like how fast it's going. And so we will take control. We'll do whatever it takes to get where we want to go as fast as we can go in any way that we can go. Listen, we are a people who will take control if life is not moving as fast in the way we want it to. doesn't matter if you're standing in line at Walmart or waiting for a phone call. If you can fix it, if you can do something with it, you're going to grab a hold of it. We're impatient. We get frustrated. We want things to move. We want things to happen. And that's why a lot of times we struggle with the way that God works. See, the bottom line is, is that God is the one that's in control. God is the one who is working. And He doesn't often work in the way we think He should work. And He doesn't often work in the time frame we want Him to work. He doesn't often do it in the way we want him to do it. And that leaves us feeling frustrated. That leaves us in fear. And that leaves us impatient. So just like the turtle on the skateboard, we'll try to take control to change our circumstance. And anyone who's ever done that will tell you it doesn't work out good. So, what do we do as believers who are impatient we live in an impatient world. And that's one of the questions that Jesus answers in his parables today. In Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 34, Jesus declares through two separate sets of parables that his kingdom is being revealed for everyone to see. And how you respond to it makes all the difference. Today we're going to look at both sets of the parables, and then we're going to talk about how they apply to our lives this morning. If you are a Christian this morning, these two parables, these two sets of parables, should help you to understand that you need to be confident that God is working around you. And you need to be patient and let Him work. You need to be confident that God is working around you. You need to be patient and let Him work. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, this passage should help us uh, answer the question, who is Jesus? And this morning, if you're willing to accept Him for who He is, and accept His offer for rescue from your separation from God, He will reconcile you to God this morning. So as we begin this morning, let me give you a little context, a little bit of background for our passage. Our text is in the book of Mark, and Mark is an account of the gospel, meaning it's a telling of the good news. And the good news is that Jesus Christ, through His work on the cross, offers anyone who comes to him in faith, rescued from the separation from God. That's the good news. That's what Mark is all about. Now our passage is in a larger section. It begins in chapter 3, verse 7, and it goes through chapter 6, verse 6. And the whole focus of this section is answering the question, who is Jesus? And the one answering the question is Jesus himself. He's declaring over and over again that I am God and King. That is my identity. He is proving that he's God and King because he's doing miracles that only God himself can do. And he's doing all this. He's declaring this message. He's performing the miracles to prove that he can forgive sin and rescue man from his separation from God. Jesus is making sure that everyone knows who he is. Something else we see in this section as well is that people as they're around Jesus, they're polarized one way or the other. They're either going to accept him or reject him. There doesn't seem to be a lot of middle, middle ground. Now, as we start at chapter 4, verse 1, we see that Jesus is around the Sea of Galilee. We see that he has gotten into a boat and he's teaching a little bit off the shore. He's getting some separation from the crowds. The crowds 
are so big and they're crushing on him just to try to touch him because they think they would be healed if they touch him. Jesus is more interested in the message. He wants to get that separation so he can tell the truth about himself. And what he's doing is he's, he's teaching mainly through parables. Now for us, parables are cute little stories, cute little illustrations. What parables really are are hand grenades with the pins pulled. They are designed to shatter a believer's comfortable world, an unbeliever's comfortable world. They are designed to elicit a crisis of belief. So you've got to look at yourself and make a response to who God is, who Christ is, and who His kingdom is. And then we see in chapter 4, verses 3 through 9, that Jesus starts this off by, by doing the parable of the sower, something we talked about two weeks ago. And after Jesus teaches the parable of the sower, we see in verses 10 through 20, that his followers, they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. So Jesus explains the parable. But then, he says, let me tell you why I teach you parables. He says that parables reveal the person's heart who's hearing it. See, if you are open to me, if you are responsive to me, if you believe that I am God and King, then God reveals you the truth of the parables. You might not know everything, but you'll know enough, and God makes sure of that. But you've already rejected me. If you're unresponsive to me, if you're not willing to accept me as God and King, then you will either not understand or you will reject it. Jesus says that if you reject the parable, it reveals that you've already rejected me. He teaches in parables to reveal the person's heart. So as we get into our passage today, we start looking at verses 21 through 25. We see that Jesus continues teaching with two parables, but they're in a set. It's the parable of the lamp, uh, and it's the parable um, of the measure. The parable of the lamp and the parable of the measure. And understand that, that these two parables are connected together. Jesus is using them to give a common understanding of what he's about to say. Now from what we can tell... Jesus is still in the boat or hanging around the boat close to it. We believe he is still in that same setting that he was in earlier in chapter 4. He's still talking to his followers. So this continuation of them not understanding the parable of the sower is continuing to go on. This is all one same conversation. And when Jesus starts off in verse 21, he tells the parable of the lamb. And it seems to make a lot of sense. It's really not a hard one to grasp. Jesus says, listen, if you got a lamp and it's lit, are you going to stick it in the basket? Are you going to stick it underneath your bed? Are you going to stick it where everybody can see it? What's the point of having a lamp and not everybody's going to see it? And the answer is you're going to put it where everybody can see the light. The light is going to fill the room. And Jesus says the information that was once hidden is now being revealed. And it's being revealed for everyone to see. And then he ends with that characteristic let he who hear, let he who have ears, let him hear. So what is this light? What is this light that's coming from this lamp that everybody can see? What is this information that Jesus is saying is so revealed, so obvious for everybody to see like a light with a lamp? What he's talking about is himself. He says, I'm the light coming from the lamp. The information that everybody can see is me. I am God and King. I am the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. I am the suffering servant of Isaiah. I am the Passover lamb. I am all authority. Everything bows before me. I can forgive sin. I can rescue man from his separation from God. The truth about me is being revealed for everyone to see like a light that is lighting up the room. You know who I am. Jesus says the truth is there. And you can't deny it, but you can't deny a lie in the lamb. Then Jesus switches gears to verses 23, 24 through 25. And he gives us the parable of the measure. Now do understand that during this time period that you didn't buy things in prepackaged containers. You know, they didn't come in nice plastic bags. When you wanted to buy something, usually it was measured out on a scale. And the person who was measuring out, the merchant who was measuring out like grain, they could either be generous and give you more than what you were paying for, or they could hold back and give you less. And Jesus says, this is the way it is with me. 
that those who are open, those who are responsive to the truth about me, God is going to be generous and he's going to reveal more about me. Those who are open, those who are responsive to the truth about me, God is going to give you spiritual insight to a deeper understanding of who I am and who he is. But you who are close-minded, you who are not responsive, you who are not willing to hear, he will give less and less. He'll be less generous in the measure. He will allow you to become spiritually blind because of your own choice. If you're responsive, the measure's more. If you're not, the measure's less. Listen, I, I think we've all experienced this, Christian. Maybe in our own lives, or we've seen other believers who are just excited about Christ. They want to grow intimate with Him. They want to grow deeper in Him. So they pursue Him in prayer. They pursue Him in Bible study every day. And we see these people grow in maturity. We see these people grow in their understanding of the Lord. His measure is coming greater and greater because of their love and their pursuit. But then there's the other side. We know people who continually reject and reject and reject. People who deny, deny, deny. And they become so hard-hearted. They don't want to hear anything about Christ, anything about the Bible. And we sit there and we go, man, I don't remember them being this hard. I don't remember them being this confrontational. And the truth is they weren't. It was a process over time. Rejection after rejection after rejection after rejection. So what is Jesus saying? The truth about me is revealed for everyone to see like a light on a lamp. And how you respond to it makes a difference. How you respond to it matters. And this morning you may not be a Christian, you may not be a believer, but the reality is you do know the truth of Jesus Christ because that truth is like a light on a lamp for everyone to see. You know it, just like everyone else. The reality is that you know the truth. The question is, how are you going to respond to it? Because that does make the difference. So once the Holy Spirit, I believe that God is making you aware of who Christ is. He's making you aware of His love for you. The love that God has created you to know. The love that God has created you to experience. A love that He wants you to have. But He's also making you aware of the fact that you've rejected Him. God's not rejected you. You've rejected Him. You've rejected His love. His will. His way. His truth. Simply because you want to do it in your will. In your way. And believe your truth. Because you have chosen to be your God. You are the ultimate source of authority in your life. And when you choose to be your God, you choose to be eternally separated from the one true God. And that separation is forever. And that separation you can't fix. And that separation you can't rescue yourself from. But here's the good news. Jesus, God the Son, in His love for you, died on the cross to pay for the penalty of your rejection. He died on the cross to pay a debt that you cannot pay. So if you come to Him believing He is who He says He is, then He will forgive you and rescue you. Jesus as God and King is offering today to rescue you from your separation from God, to forgive you of your sin, and all you have to do is come to Him and say, I believe you are God and King. And you can do just that. The truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ is being revealed to you right now. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Understand that how you respond, it does make a difference. Let's well, turn back to our text and we pick up verses 26 through 52. We see the next set of parables. Uh, we see the parable of the rolling seed and the parable of the mustard seed. Understand that these two parables, once again, are a set. They are complementary. They actually help uh, lead to what Jesus is trying to say. 
In the parable of the growing seed, Jesus says the kingdom of God, or my kingdom, living under my authority and my will, as I as your king and heaven is your home. He said, let me tell you what it's like. It's like this guy, he's going out, probably his farmer, and he's throwing seed everywhere. And magically, this seed sprouts up. It's not magic, it's what happens, what God does, right? What he's saying is it doesn't matter if this guy's asleep, it doesn't matter if this guy's awake. This guy doesn't stop the seed from growing, nor does he help it grow. He has no power. It's the work of God. God does the work. God grows the seed. All this guy comes down and is harvesting it. The guy can't stop it. The guy can't help it. God's the one who grows the seed. So then he goes to the parable of the mustard seed. And Jesus says, listen, the kingdom of God, my kingdom, the kingdom where you live, is heaven is your home, and me is your king. He said, it is like the mustard seed. And you guys know that a mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. It's as small as it can be. But when you plant that thing, it explodes. It grows to a mustard tree or a mustard bush that's somewhere 6 to 12 feet tall. From the smallest of seeds, this thing just explodes. Flows everywhere, and it gets so big that birds nest in it. Birds find their rest in it. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying this. Just like the farmer does nothing to grow the crop, that's the work of God, no one can stop my kingdom, and no one can help my kingdom. It's my I am God and King. I have all power and authority. And my will is going to be done. I am going to declare the truth about me. And I'm going to reveal my truth to all people. I will forgive sin and I will rescue man. And no person helps it and no person hinders it. Nobody stops it and nobody moves it along. It's my will. I do it. I can only let you be a part of the harvest. And then Jesus says, listen, if you look at my kingdom right now, it looks small. We're just hanging out with, with a few people in Galilee, but it's going to explode. It's going to be glorious. I am going to fulfill my kingdom. I'm going to die on the cross. And I will be the ultimate and final sacrifice of the sins of man. And all who come to me, I am going to rescue them. All who come to me in faith, I will rescue from the separation from God. And just like a bird finds rest in the branches of the mustard tree, all who come to me will find rest. Eternal rest. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, my kingdom will be done. I am God and King. Nothing can stop it. What I want is going to happen. Everything bows before me. And it may not look like much now. But after my death, burial, resurrection, it's going to explode. And it's going to be glorious. And all will find rest in me. So Christian, as we see and hear those last two parables, is there anything that we can grab a hold of? As impatient people in an impatient world. Let me just take two ways. Number one, be confident. Be confident that God is working. Be confident. Here's the reality for most Christians, including myself. We have no idea half the time what God's doing. No clue how he's working it out. We have no clue in what His will and His ways and how He's doing it. We have no clue how He's going to bring it all together. We look at our lives, we look at our situations, we look at our problems, we look at our issues, and we sit there and we go, I don't even know if God is working. And that leads to fear, and that leads to frustration, and that leads to impatience. And believe me, we have all felt it. Those of you who know me know that I have a deep respect for missionaries, that their commitment, their sacrifice. But the one thing that I've learned about missionaries, the ones that I've talked to, the ones that I'm friends with, and the ones that I've read throughout history, is that just about all of their ministries, they had a dark time. A time when they could never see God working. A time when they struggled. 
I was recently reading, reading about a missionary by the name of Mary Moffat. Her and her husband served in South Africa in the 1800s. And they went through several years. They didn't see God doing anything in their ministry. And she struggled. And this is what she wrote in her journal. She said, could we but see the smallest fruit? We rejoice amidst the privations and toil which we bear. As it is, our hands do often hang down empty. I don't see God working. I don't know where he's at. I don't know what he's doing. And you don't have to be a missionary to feel that way. You can look at your own life. You can look at your own situations. And we start saying, God, where are you? What are you doing? God, I don't feel your presence. I need you to be here. And we wonder where he is. And the reality is that when that happens, we start full of fear and frustration. And we become impatient. And we end up being the turtle on the skateboard. We grab a hold of it. We try to take control. We try to get something done fast, easy, in our direction, in our way. And Christian, I say this in love. When we make that decision, what we're saying is God can't handle it, but I can. That's what we're actually saying. So what do we understand from these parables? That God is working. That God is all-powerful. That Jesus Christ is over all people, all nations, all situations. Everything bows before Him. There's nothing beyond Him. There's nothing greater than Him. There's nothing out of His reach. He has a plan. He has a direction. He is moving in a way for our good and for His glory. And so in that, we must be confident in Him. Because Christian, the bottom line is this. You cannot control anything and you cannot change anything. You can just screw it up. We need to be confident that our God and King is working. We may not see it. We may not understand it. We may not feel it. But we believe it. Because He says what I do, I do for your good and my glory. Be confident that His plan will be fulfilled. Number two, be patient. Be patient. That was the moment that everybody went to the <laughs> Be patient. Yeah, listen, it, you, you feel it. You feel the tension, right? Be patient. We live in a jacked up world. We live in a world that we want instant gratification. We want the world that's like this. We live in a world where we want everything at McDonald's speed. We want everything right now when we want it. We want it at faster speed. I feel like we're all a bunch of kids going to Disney World asking every five minutes, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Thinking it's going to get us there faster. You know, we're always in a hurry. Therefore, we think God is in a hurry. God is not in a hurry. For God, the journey is just as important as the destination. In fact, if you look at Scripture, if you look at this passage, and you read over and over again, what you begin to find out is that God never promises instantaneous growth. He never promises an instantaneous fix. He never promises an instantaneous change. He normally works through a process. So what do we do? We grasp the idea, O oh, turtle on the skateboard, that you cannot fix it. And you can't speed it up. And you can't slow it down. Because he's in control. So we choose to be patient. We choose to be confident that he's working. We choose to believe that in his way, and in his time, and for his glory, and for our good, that he will make Himself no. Mm -hmm. Be patient. Be confident. Enjoy the ride. Trust the King. That's how we as impatient people make an impatient world. 
So to turn back the text, we see in verses 33 through 34 that Mark kind of ends this time of parables by summarizing the saying that, that Jesus, he taught in parables as much as they were able to hear, as much as they were able to understand, as much as they were able to listen. He's reemphasizing what we already know, that those who are open, those who are responsive, those who accepted Jesus Christ, God was revealing more and more about himself too. And those who didn't get it, Jesus handed it off to the side. But those who were close-minded, those who would not receive it, those who were rejecting it, they didn't understand. Jesus taught in parables to reveal the heart of the one hearing it. So as we come to the end of our questions, the end of our time, the end of our text today, the question that we have is, what is the Holy Spirit revealing to you? What has the Holy Spirit revealed to you during this time? Are you willing to hear it? Or are you going to choose to reject it? But I do believe the truth that he wants us to know is shining like the light of a lamp for all to see. As we look at this text, one thing that comes out very clear is that we need to choose to be confident in who Jesus is and what he's doing. We need to choose to be confident in who Jesus is and what he's doing all around us. What does that mean to us this morning? Well, if you're not a Christian, if you're confident in who Jesus is, that means that you're going to accept His offer to come to Him through faith in Jesus Christ. In just a few moments, we're going to have what we call the invitation. It's a time that you're just invited to respond as the Holy Spirit is leading you. And I do believe right now the Holy Spirit is making you aware, because that's what He does of your separation from God because of your rejection and your sin, then God's offering you to come to Him through faith in Jesus Christ. As the Holy Spirit makes you aware of that during the invitation, I invite you to come forward and talk to any of us down front. We'd love to tell you more about Jesus and His love for you and how He will change your life forever if you let Him. Christian, what does this mean for you to be confident in who Jesus is and that he's working all around you. What it means this? It means that you actually believe that he's God King. But you act actually confident that his will will be done in whatever you're facing in your life. And therefore, you're going to be patient for him to work. During the invitation, Christian, I just encourage you to spend time worshiping Christ, thanking him for who he is and what he's done for you. Tell him that you're confident. In His power, and His authority, His will is going to be done in your life. And if there's any area that you have grabbed a hold of, if there's any area that you're the turtle on the schedule, that you're letting go, and you're going to wait on Him. As you're praying through that, if you need help, you need encouragement, the altar is open, we'll be down here, you can come pray with us, you can pray with those beside you. This morning, it doesn't matter who you are, Christian or someone who's not quite there yet. This morning, the truth of Jesus Christ is like the light of the lamp for everyone to see. And those who accept Him for who He says He is, and those who accept His offer of rescue and eternal life, those who are confident that He is working all around them, those who are patient waiting on Him to work, those people will have rest in His arms like a bird in the branch of a mustard tree.